Let me pray, and we'll begin the sermon from the book of Hebrews. Lord God, we come. We thank you. I pray that you would comfort those this morning that need comfort. There are families, uh, widows, widowers, orphans, who this date means something special because of the loss that they experienced. Um, even thinking within our church, there are some that have anniversaries today that they can go and have dinner together, and others who have anniversaries today that remember that their spouse is gone. <laughs> And God, our life is full of ups and downs, joys and pains, and we need your help to make it through. But Lord, stir in us a hope and a reminder that there's coming a day where you will wipe away every tear, where there will be no more cancer, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more destruction or separation no more pride or selfishness or angry words or abusive fists. God, you are going to make this world as it was meant to be. Help us to long for that day, anticipating it, knowing that it's going to come. Knowing that, as the Bible says, that this earth is like birth pains, that when we enter into your existence for eternity, we will say it was all worth it. People are reminded in this moment, for those of us in this room who are not yet saved, the Bible says, What gaineth a person to gain the entire world and lose their soul? What a waste to go through this painful life and not have eternity with you. So, Holy Spirit, stir in hearts. Call people to yourself. May this be a day of life as we remember this day of death. So in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. We are studying the book of Hebrews today, and so if you open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to finish the chapter. Um, I have had the opportunity a couple of times to donate blood. I don't know if any of you have as well. Um, one time they black flagged me because I had been to Ghana and I couldn't donate anymore. And then we moved from Illinois, and they continue to call me, even though I told them I've moved. Anybody? Like Red, Red Cross, just, they want your blood. They need more blood. Why? Because your blood can save somebody's life. Because there can be somebody in a hospital who is in need of a transfusion that needs your type of blood, and so you can offer what you have to save somebody. Well, we in our earthly existence can only do so much. I can only save one person. I can only do what I can through the giving that I do. It, I think Red Cross would say that your blood tr donation can save three lives. So I guess you can save three people, but you can't save the world. You can't save the masses. But we're going to talk today about the blood of one who does. Because <laughs> my blood is limited, but the blood of Jesus Christ can bring redemption to the world. If you look at the title of today's message in your bulletin, you'll see that it is not just redemption for a moment. It is eternal redemption through the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to look at verses 11 through 28 this morning. I'll remind you, if you're unable to stand, you're okay to sit. Stand in your heart. Stand with your soul. Uh, we're just standing in reverence. If you need to sit down while I'm reading, I will not frown you. Um, you're welcome to do that as well. This is the word of the Lord. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing, here it is, an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred 
that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared to Moses, to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood of both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. If I can be so transparent, would somebody please bring me a Kleenex or two to wipe my face? I'd appreciate it. Well, this morning, I want us to look at a question of what does being redeemed by Christ's blood accomplish? We talk about this redemption. We talk about it being eternal. But what does it do for us? What does it accomplish? And so I want to look at three answers today. The first thing being that when we are redeemed by Christ's blood, it accomplishes purification. Thank you. Again, point one is that it brings purification. You'll notice in the text, verses 11 through 14, it talks about Jesus who comes as a high priest. Now again, last week we considered the old covenant and how it was done. Remember all the blood that needed to be shed every single day, every single year in the temple and in the tabernacle. God bless you. But when Christ appeared as high priest, notice, of the good things that have come, some of your Bibles might say that are yet to come. The translation there is not so clear, but we would agree that it is an already and a not yet, wouldn't we? That there are things that are happening that are still yet to be accomplished. There is both. Notice that through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Many people would say there that's either through himself or through the heavenly throne of God. More perfect tent, the place where we go to meet God, remember? That's what the tent was, a tent of meeting. And so the place of more perfect tent of meeting would be to go where God is, not for God to go where we are. Jesus Christ was fully man, fully God, the revelation of God in human flesh. But he also sits at the right hand of the Father even today. It says that he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. The reason why this is so important is because the blood of a calf or the blood of a goat expired. But the blood of our Savior is forever. In fact, he's still alive. The living sacrifice. He offers his own blood. Notice, securing an eternal, there it is, a forever redemption. We're going to talk about this word this morning. Forever. For if the blood of goats and bulls and sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of the heifer sanctify and purify the flesh, 
then how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, because God's eternal as well, offered himself without blemish to God? This is important. God not only, Jesus Christ not only died as a perfect death, he lived the perfect life. He didn't just come to earth and die. He came to earth and lived for 33 years and then died the perfect sacrifice. Without blemish, the spotless lamb, purifying our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This is one of the things, this idea of purification here at the end of verse 14 that you need to understand comes with redemption. You are purified. This doesn't mean that the war against the flesh is over. But the idea of purification is that bad things are removed. Now, if I pass something through purification, it probably needs to go through a couple of levels of purification. And so it takes a while in the human heart, maturity of the faith, do it again. Lord, cleanse my heart, purify my mind. This is not a one-time only thing. But it is something that we will be eternally purified. And he does, over time, purify our conscience. He helps us to see what we see as evil, as he sees as evil. The reality is, without God, we were not as much aware of our sin, because we didn't know what sin was. But with God, with the Holy Spirit, with the conscience of the Lord, I am more convicted by the things I do than I was without Christ. Now, am I sinning more? No. But I'm more aware of the sinning. Does that make sense? Our conscience is being purified from the evil that we would do, pursuing the things of God. Notice, serving the living God is what it changes. So it purifies us from what we used to be, right? Dead works, doing things that had no eternal value, the Bible says that even the good things that we do, I said this the other day, that atheists can adopt children and can give money to homeless people and can do good things. But it's of no eternal value because when their works are tested by fire, it will all be burned up because it was not done for the Lord. Dead works. Not necessarily evil, just things that have no value beyond this life. We are transferred from that, purified into serving the living God. It changes our audience. It changes our motivation. It changes what we do and why we do it. Jesus says to put our, uh, invest in the future where moth and rust can't destroy, right? He says, blessed are those, and he gives a list of things that God says, I will reward you. We put an investment in the future. We want to serve the living God. A couple passages to consider beyond this one, if you want to write them down, is um, there's room in your bulletin to write stuff down if you want to. 1 John 1, verses 7, 8, and 9. You've probably heard this before. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, here it is, cleanses us from all sin. This cleansing, purification. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... <laughs> He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us, purify us, from all unrighteousness. This is what God does through his blood. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, we see a helpful passage here talking about Jesus Christ who gives himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. You see here, the purification is in the motivation of living. It's why I'm here. I'm purifying even the very reason of my existence. Purifying my words, purifying my thoughts, purifying my actions, because to be purified is to be pursuing God who purifies for himself a people, zealous for good works. Purification. And thinking of this, um, it's often easy to land on the purification of water. Um, we live in Crown Point. It's a, a blessing. People move here maybe because of it. But we get water from Lake Michigan. You know, St. John is on a well, and Lowell's on a well, and Cedar Lake. I hope they don't get the water from the lake. You know, there are, there's things that are around here that we want our water to be purified. Now, 
as pure as your water might be by the people at the plant, how many of you have a Brita purification filter in your home or whatever name it is and say, I need it more pure? Like the water from the tap is not pure enough, and we purify it because we want our water to be clean, to be clear. Well, there's an organization that's promoted themselves here. Uh, Daryl Ross, one of our elders, is part of it, and Mike Robertson used to play the drums here as part of it as well. There's a called God Water, and they have a ministry where they bring purified water and the living water to people in Liberia who need it. And I want to show you a photo that I put together of some uh, before and after. There's this water that they could be drinking, or there's water that is purified. I want to use this as an example. Because this water that's purified is purified by passing water through a filter that the bad stuff can't fit through. It's actually the science of smaller holes that water can go through, but the bacteria and all the other things can't. Now, church, we are purified when all the stuff of the flesh, all the stuff of evil is held back, and what comes through is pure. And you know what does that? The Holy Spirit, God's Word, God's people are a filter that we run our lives through that hold the evil things back. Because to be purified is to have the bad stuff removed. It's not to be given anything new. It's actually to be having things taken away. Purification. You have what God wants within you and some junk. We call it sin. And God wants to purify your conscience, purify your words, purify your actions by keeping back the things that are against his will, by keeping back all unrighteousness. So the blood of Christ brings purification. Second of all, we see the blood of Christ brings forgiveness. This is one we often reference, especially in children's ministries that accept the blood of Christ to be forgiven. But look what it says in the text here, verses 15 through 22. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Let me pause there. This eternal inheritance was ours to begin with. Christ created humanity to dwell with him forever. That was the purpose, Genesis 1 and 2. That inheritance has been tainted, has been stolen, has been taken away because of sin, because of the fallenness of humanity. Remember the evil of our world. And so Jesus, as a mediator of a new covenant, notice, is there so that we can receive the promised inheritance that is eternal. You can receive what's yours, what was meant to be yours because God created you to be his child. That's what it should be. Jesus wants to mediate that reunion. (laughs) Notice it says that a death has occurred that redeems them, here's the idea of forgiveness, from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. The idea of why we don't inherit the inheritance that God has promised to us is because we don't qualify for it anymore. It says, I am holy, be holy. It's We have to be perfect to be among a perfect God. And so when we sin, for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God, we break our ability to receive the inheritance. We disqualify ourselves from the contract of what God has promised. The writer of Hebrews references this idea of our world. And those of you that have dealt with deaths or my wife and I are actually making our, li- our will currently and so there's certain things that have to happen right for a will to, to be enacted this is actually the biggest uh, backstab of the prodigal son is when he said father give me my inheritance he was saying basically father I wish you were dead and the father gives him what he shouldn't have given him because he's not dead yet but out of the love yet for his son he gives part of his inheritance to him saying, in effect, I am dead. (laughs) Because that's when a will begins, isn't it? I can't make a will take place without my own death. My will is enacted when I die. And the writer of Hebrews says that. Verse 16, For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For will takes effect only at death, since it is not enforced as long as the one who made it is alive. Church, God made the promise. 
God made the will of what would happen if he died, and then he came and died. And when God says, for the people that receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, here is your inheritance, we don't argue against the will. Many of you, if you saw the will of your grandfather and he wanted to give you the house or wanted to give you a million dollar shares in Amazon, like, you wouldn't argue against the will when you realized how great of a thing it was, would you? But so many of us in our world would say, I don't want that, God. I, I, I do not desire to be with you forever. And they bolden their heart to refuse what God wants to offer to them if they just believe. <laughs> Christ as God, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, came, he died, and his will is being lived out. It says, verse 18, continuing on, therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. Um, and so it talks about how there was blood that was used. The people who heard this would have understood. We've already talked about it ourselves. You know, the blood of animals would have been a way of forgiveness, but also a way of purification. We talked about that earlier. And in 20, it says, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And Moses used that terminology, and he sprinkled it all over the tent and the vessels and the people. And everything was purified by blood, it says in 22. Almost everything under the law was purified by blood. And then here's an important thing we need to remember. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. If you do not receive the shed blood of Jesus Christ, your sins cannot be forgiven. Without shed blood, there is no forgiveness. I don't care what path you take. I don't care what path the world wants to tell you, whether it be the good things that you do, uh, be better than your neighbor. These things are not leaving forgiveness because without blood being shed, there is no forgiveness of sin. God has modeled that for us. He requires blood. Jesus gave his blood for you so that you don't have to give your own. Because if you're not going to let Jesus die for you, then you're going to die for you eternally, separated from the Father. But he doesn't want it that way. He sent his son because he loves the world so much that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Church, our God loves us and sent Jesus to die for us. Blood has been shed. Forgiveness of sin is available. Will you receive it even today? Other passages that would support this idea. Uh, look at Leviticus 17, 11. This is from the Old Testament. Speaking of how it was. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. This is what God said to the people of Israel. I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is here the blood that makes atonement by the life. Blood is needed for forgiveness. In Matthew 26, 28, from the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out. Why? For, the, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. That's why the blood was shed, to forgive us from what we have done. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, we see this passage. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace. We didn't deserve to get it, but his blood brings forgiveness, brings a renewal of relationship, brings the old is gone, the new is come. You are my child again. Look at a famous passage from Romans chapter 5, 9, 10, and 11. It says, Since therefore we have now been justified, made right in his eyes by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Again, we were supposed to receive the wrath. His blood forgives us and gives us the blessings, the inheritance. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So I give you a, a definition of a word that we might not use often, that word reconciliation. Reconciliation is most beneficially in this terminology or in this context defined as a reestablishment of an interrupted or broken relationship. That's what it means to be reconciled. If you have reconciliation with your father, that means you build back the relationship that you didn't have that was broken. Church, the blood of Christ reconciles us, brings us back from enemies of God to children of God. We see that even in Romans chapter 8. 
Verses 14 through 17 of Romans 8, Romans 8 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. This children idea, it's important. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. We've been adopted. Our God is our Father. As sons by whom we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Church, the blood of Christ forgives us and makes us his children, not receiving his wrath, but receiving his blessings, his love, himself. Our culture is uh, riddled with the pains and suffocation of debt, and most to blame would be that of credit cards. Now, this is a word of warning to all those that are under the age of 25. Be careful. Um, just because you can buy something doesn't mean you should. Just because your credit card limit says you can spend $50,000, you might not want to because you'll end up paying 100000 with all the fees that they give you for borrowing that money. There are people in our church even today who might have papers look like this on their table because debt is a damaging suffocation of our finances that we feel like we can't escape. Um, Dave Ramsey has something called Financial Peace University because we don't often have financial peace, but we desire it. We want it. I'm not saying the church will do this, but imagine the joy you'd find when you opened a letter expecting another past due bill, and instead of the amounts due, it said this, paid, <laughs> paid. <laughs> There'd be so much liberation. You'd feel so free. You'd feel like you have a new opportunity to make better choices. There is something that just forgiveness of what we've gotten ourselves into just brings us a new hope in life, doesn't it? I mean, it does when it comes to finances. It does when it comes to relationships. How much more when it comes to our relationship with our Creator God? Jesus Christ, His blood offers forgiveness for us to say that debt is paid, atoned for. No more debt. <laughs> Enemies to children, an inheritance from the Father. And if an inheritance, then an inheritance like Christ, like it says in Romans 8. Well, finally, we can uh, just reflect back. We've been purified, we've been forgiven. But thirdly, being redeemed by Christ's blood brings finality. It's final. It is done. I'm telling myself real men cry, so don't, don't tell me otherwise, okay? Um, but this is real sensitive stuff that there are people that need to hear the message and people who um, will wish they did. Um, so it's, it's heavy on my heart. Um, being redeemed by Christ's blood brings finality. It is done. Look at what it says in verses 23 to 28. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, these often um, shedding of animal bloods. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Is the blood of Christ better than the blood of a lamb or a goat or an ox? You better believe it. It's God's blood himself, not the one who created the things that it's blood. And it's also the blood of one who's alive today, not one that is dead. For Christ has entered into the holy places, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, we talked about that last week, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Again, Jesus Christ is with the Father. He's been accepted. I've heard it said that um, Jesus wrote a check for the payments of sin on, good, on Friday. And on Sunday, God said that the check cleared. Like there was enough in the account to cover it. That's what happened when Jesus was raised from the dead that Jesus, God said, yes, enough to pay the debt. He's in the heavenly places, sitting at the right hand of the Father. 
It says that into heaven itself on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself, here we go, repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with the blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of his church. This is an important truth you need to know, church, is that if Jesus Christ has to die again, that means the first payment wasn't enough. If we need to add more things to be forgiven to our sins, then the blood of Jesus Christ, who was spilled on a cross that looked something like that, or a tree over 2,000 years ago, out in an area in Israel, there is something to be said about If I have to add to that, then it's not enough. So Jesus is a liar, because on the cross he said, It is finished. Remember? Once for all, in talking with um, some brothers in Christ, this might even be something to be considering for people's view on communion. Um, there are some people that think that when they take communion that he sacrifices again for them. And it, to sacrifice again means that it wasn't enough the first time, right? There's something about once for all. He puts away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, this is an important text for us to remember. Um, I think they said that you can count on uh, death, taxes. Is there another thing? I think those are the only ones that we can always guarantee. We'll have death and taxes. Um, but we are all going to die. It's appointed to die once. This is not allowing for us to believe in reincarnation. That would be dying more than once, right? I mean, this is clearly speaking. We live this life one time. We die one time. Um, you know the phrase YOLO? Some of the younger people know what I'm talking about. You only live once. No, it would be YODO. You only die once. Though even that could be challenged as I'm speaking out loud because some people die eternally as well, don't they? I want to only die once. I want to live twice. I want to live here on this earth, and I want to live in eternity with the Lord. And I had an existence before I was saved, but now that I've been saved, I've been born again to live a new life. I'm not only living once. I hope you don't only live once. But it is appointed to die, and then after that comes judgment. We can't escape that. People that preach of an annihilation, that we just die and then we're just buried and done. No, we are eternal beings made in the image of God. It's not, will I live forever? It's, where will I be forever, right? It's, are you with God or are you apart from him? Is it eternal life or is it eternal death? Eternity is the future of everybody made in the image of God. Judgment determines which path we take. Verse 28, continuing on, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, because that's been done. It's final. Why is Christ coming back? Why do I say, come, Lord Jesus, come? To save those who are eagerly waiting for him. If I told you as believers that you need to be saved, you probably would argue it or say, no, I don't. I've already been saved. No, you need to be saved from this world. You need to be saved from the war against your flesh. You need to be saved from the evils all around you. Come, Lord Jesus, come, because I don't want to live here forever. The reality, though, is I'm 36, and many younger people in this audience who would say, Jesus, come, but like maybe in 10 years, like, I'd like to see my children get married. I'd like to meet somebody. I'd like to get that really good job and have that second house on the beach and, and get that really cool new Tesla. And there are things I really want to accomplish. There's things I want to do. And then you can come. Church, at the very end of this passage, I say that I am waiting for him. You are probably waiting for him. The word that hits me the hardest as I studied this was the word eagerly. Do I want him to come more than I want anything else? Do I desire his return to be with him forever? Lord Jesus, come. The term is used, Maranatha. Come and get me. 
There's a, a camp that Moody has conferences at every once in a while called Maranatha, and they have a song. A Maranatha, come and get me. That's what I want my heart to be. I want it to be so ready to be taken by the Lord that I'll do ministry as long as I can, but I'm ready to be gone. I've actually changed what I say. It's not, Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow. It's, Lord willing, tomorrow we'll be in heaven. Because that's where I want to be. Do you want to be there? Turning back to this 9-11 idea, many people are not really longing for heaven because this life feels pretty good. I could live here a little longer. There are people who are abused emotionally, physically, sexually, daily that would say, Lord Jesus, come, because their life feels like hell to them. The danger of the American culture is there are people on their way to hell that life is pretty good. And the reality is that's as close as they're going to get to heaven. And they're going to wish that they could have so much more. The sufferings of our life, the struggles that we go through are not fun. I'm not happy that Nancy Brown died. But they are a reminder that we're just passing through. They're a reminder that this is not our home. They're a reminder that we need to be saved again from this world by our Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to come and save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Let me close with a couple of passages of Scripture. Um, we, we would reference this maybe in an idea of Jesus paid it all, right? Um, this is something we'd use in our church vocabulary. But what that means is that Jesus paid it all past present, and future. In 1 Peter 3, 18, we see this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Suffered once for sins. Romans 6, 9 and 10, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. No longer has dominion, death has no longer a dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Final verse here, 1 John 2, 2 says, He is the propitiation, the payment for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Church, what Christ did on the cross was not just to die for you. It was to die for all that would be saved. But I need to say this because people would be um, confused or misled by this, these passages in the sense that God is a gentleman. <laughs> he will not force you to be with him. He gives you the choice. <laughs> the Bible says that narrow is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to righteousness, but wide is the gate and wide is the path that leads to destruction. Many will not choose Christ is the reality of our world. Don't be one of the many that don't choose Christ. Because he died for you, so you don't have to die for yourself. The payment is made. Receive it. Accept it. What a waste for you to have to pay something that's already been paid. Financially, that would be bad counsel to pay a bill that's already been paid. Spiritually, Christ died once for all. Finality, it is done. I'll use this analogy, and then we'll be done. Uh, many of you have experiences of graduation. Some of us uh, college, I'll go backwards. Um, some of us high school, some of us kindergarten, some of us preschool. I mean, I think everybody here has graduated from something. Uh, my son reminded me of that when I talked about graduation. Um, but the reality is the foolishness of us paying for our own debt, of us not accepting the love of Jesus Christ who died on our behalf, would be like a graduate from high school a year later turning in a paper to his English teacher. I mean, you've graduated. It's done. There's no more need for the work. <laughs> now, that is true for the person that um, doesn't see the need for Jesus Christ, that there is something that we need to say that only through Christ can we reach where we need to be. But church, so many often, that I would say this to us, and this analogy really applies to the church this way, is that we forget that we're forgiven. We feel like we need to do something to get forgiven. We forget that the blood of Christ has paid it all. 
And we begin to have shame, and we begin to have doubt, and we begin working on that English paper, and we forget that we already wore the cap and gown. Where Jesus Christ has paid it all. We are forgiven. Just come back to him. Repent and be forgiven. Our relationship with Jesus Christ or with God can be broken though we are children, and that's what confession is for. Confess your sins to God, and he is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. But you are not going to be in a place that you have to receive the blood of Jesus Christ again. Remember Gen- Hebrews 6 that says, if he comes again, then that is saying that he is a liar. Jesus is not coming again. There is no death of Christ a second time. Accept him today. Jesus is greater. He's greater than your need to be perfect. He's greater than your um, brokenness. There's nowhere you can go to flee from his presence. You, Jesus Christ um, saved the uttermost. The lie of the devil is you are not worthy to be saved. No, that's the truth of the gospel. You're not worthy to be saved, but Jesus loves you anyways. There's a song by Shane and Shane about that. It's like the devil's preaching the truth. I am not worthy to be saved, and Jesus is like, I died for you while you're not worthy. And his blood makes you a child of the king. Now, I know I'm a pastor at a Baptist church, and this might get me fired, but we're going to do communion a, a w- second week in a row, okay? Um, and I'm going to ask the elders to get the elements. They're actually back there in the tree room. And we are going to do communion because I think that we need to be reminded again about the blood, that it redeems us. We need to understand the reason for communion. And so we are going to pass out communion. Let me just say this as they're getting the elements that this is an idea for anybody that's saved. And if you in this moment are not saved but want to be, you can bow your heart before the Lord and say, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus to be my king, to save me. And I vow to live for him forever. And if that is the truth of your heart, then we welcome you to join us in remembering. Remembering what's been done for you. But also remembering, so last week we remembered the sacrifice, right? We talked about the, the punishment of the cross and the beating and the, the pains. But church, today I want us to remember what that blood has g- given us. Today I want us to be thinking about what the blood of Jesus has brought you, has brought me. We are redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Let me pray. And then we'll pass out the elements. Lord God, we do come. We say in this moment that we need you. We've always needed you, and we will forever need you. Jesus helped us out when he said, apart from him, we can do nothing. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And God, there are people, even now, in the hearing of my voice, whether in this room or online, listening today or later, that need the blood of Christ to cover their lives of sin. They need to be forgiven, as I need to be forgiven. For the one that says there is no sin in him is a fool, is blind to the reality that it's there, and it's really the devil who blinds us Because the devil does not want us to be saved. The devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus comes that you may have life, and that you may have life to the full. God, I pray that you would stir through your spirit in the hearts of people to see truth that you come to save. Thank you for shedding your blood, for bringing us purification, forgiveness, once and for all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.